It's on occasion that the strange and enticing mysteries that run wild in our world are oddly or suddenly solved. It can be the unexpected understanding of the universe, or even figuring out how a megalithic build came to be. Number 10. Sometimes referred to as the Horrible Hands Dinosaur, or the Beast with the Behemoth Arms, the Dinochirus Mirificus has been a long-standing mystery. Its name is a Greek term that translates to Unusual Horrible Hand. It was in July of 1965 when two immense fossilized dinosaur appendages were discovered complete with some menacing looking claws. They had been dug up in the southern area of the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. The arms had measured a lengthy 8 feet and are said to be the longest of any known bipedal beast in the history of the earth. But the only part of the prehistoric creature that was unearthed was these abnormal looking arms. This led to confusion about the nature of the dinosaur with its behemoth arms. The quest was what scary beast would have such arms and for what reason. There had been no complete fossils found of the peculiar dinosaur until half a century later in 2006 and 2009. It was in 2006 when a nearly complete fossil was discovered of the 70 million year old animal and then again in 2009. The remains had boasted further unusual traits including its awkward arms that had never been seen by any other dinosaur. A researcher would go on to explain that the creature measured 36 feet in length and weighed somewhere around 6.4 tons. It would be found that the Dinochirus was the largest member of a group of what's said to be bird-like dinosaurs. Along with the arms, the remains showed evidence that the fused tail vertebrae had also supported feathers, and the back was topped with spines that would support a sail structure with an unknown function. The Dinochirus was a river region dweller and fed on both plants and other animals such as fish. In its gut, there has been evidence of fish scales and gastroliths. Gastroliths refer to the small smooth stones that many birds use to grind plants. The remains showed a beaked snout with no teeth that flared to the sides much like the duck-billed dinosaurs. The broad feet would end with squared off hooves that are believed to aid in standing securely on wet ground. While this dinosaur moved slowly, it had a great means of defending itself thanks to its sheer size and the ripping claws that decorated each of its hands. It was these animals that met the size of the Tarbosaurus, the cousin of the Tyrannosaurus. One paleontologist stated that this dinosaur has remained one of the most mysterious ones in the world. After finding the almost complete remains, we now know how the strange creature may have looked and not just an enigmatic appendage. A University of Maryland paleontologist named Thomas Holtz made a comment on the study released in a journal, where he stated that no one could have predicted the astonishing array of attributes, and further said that he'd waited his whole life to see the Dinochirus unveiled. What's incredibly suspicious about the two unearthings in 2006 and 2009 is that both of them were missing their heads. It was later found that remains had been poached by illegal collectors but these parts would later end up with the collector in Germany and be seen by another paleontologist who recognized them and quickly informed Lee as well as other scientists. The 2006 missing piece though remains missing. Number 9. It appears that the D20 dice had been around a lot longer than its existence in the world of Dungeons and Dragons. An ancient D20 die is being held at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and is believed to be the world's oldest one. The die is made from serpentine and looks to be in good shape given its age. While it was not used for playing Dungeons and Dragons, it was likely used for other gaming purposes or spiritual ones. The 20 sided dice are made in various materials that have survived from the Hellenistic and Roman eras. Several of the die are found in Egypt, Greece and Roman collections at museums. Often, each side of the die has an inscription with a number in Greek, or sometimes Latin, from 1 to 20. Theories as to what these ancient dice were used for have been based on clues that were provided by some variants. One such unusual example makes use of Greek words that appear to resemble words that are associated with throws of the astragals. This clue led researchers to believe that they'd been used for games. Another incredible example was found in Egypt sometime during the 1980s. This example records an Egyptian god's name on each of the die's faces. 
This is suggestive of divination, where the ancient civilizations may have sought advice about the unknown from supernatural forces. This appeared to be the likely purpose of the Dakle die, where it suggested that the 20-sided tool was thrown in order to determine which of the gods could assist the individual. Even the die with simple lettering is believed to be related to divination. A Greek oracle book that was composed in the 2nd or 3rd century AD appears to refer to throwing lots in order to obtain a number. This number, through an algorithm, would lead the user to prepare oracle responses and questions. We do know that the ancient Egyptians had played various board games throughout their time, so it's not unlikely that this was the purpose of the 20-sided die. Researchers have come to believe that aside from board games, the dice were also used for these spiritual purposes. Number 8. Sandro Botticelli was a famous painter during the Florentine Renaissance. His most notable works include The Birth of Venus and La Primavera, which are said to epitomize the spirit of the Renaissance. A few of his artworks are subject to some mystery, including Madonna of the Veil and Madonna and Child. Upon its discovery in 1930, it was immediately believed that the Madonna of the Veil had been the work of the great artist, but it didn't take long for investigation to be carried out by art historians as well as scientists. It turned out that this incredible piece of art was subject to forgery. It was a fake. A noted collector of the arts, Lord Lee of Farah, had purchased the painting in 1930 from an Italian dealer for $250,000. He would then bequeath it to a gallery in 1947. While there had been a lack of information surrounding the painting, connoisseurs and academics hailed it as a masterpiece by Botticelli, and the directors of the Medici Society had published it as a superb composition of the greatest of all the Florentine painters. The attribution to the artist came into question when a director of the National Gallery, Kenneth Clark, noticed that the subject generated a different sort of charm. He suggested that it had a charm like that of a silent cinema star, and even compared Madonna to Jean Harlow. After the Second World War, a close examination of the art during a conservation treatment revealed elements that had pushed further doubt on this painting's authenticity. One clue had been that the Madonna's robe was painted using Prussian blue, which only came into use during the 18th century. Visual examination under a lens further showed that grains of pigments had been ground rather finely. During the 15th century, pigments would be hand ground, which would produce a coarser grain. In 1994, another investigation was carried out. With the use of EDX analysis, Scientists were able to detect the presence of 19th century pigments like cobalt blue, opaque chromium oxide green, and zinc chromate. Opaque chromium oxide green was not commercially available until 1862, which would place the painting's creation after that date. The technique that was used to produce this painting also appeared to exhibit inconsistencies with the actual works of Botticelli. X radiography of the panel confirmed that it was not prepared in the traditional way. A microscopic examination further revealed that Madonna's lips had been outlined with a black paint, but Botticelli would paint them with a matter lake pigment, not black. The artwork then became known as the painting of a forger named Umberto Giunti, born in 1886. He was a teacher at the Institute of Fine Art in Siena and would go on to develop a reputation for his convincing forged artworks of fresco fragments. The Madonna of the Veil piece was undoubtedly a piece intended to deceive and was not just a copy based off of Botticelli's art. Further analysis indicated that the surface cracks and paint losses were caused by intentional damage, as well as the wormholes in the panels. Stress fractures in the paint around these apparent wormholes was an indicator that a drill had been used in order to create them. In addition, the foliage seen behind Madonna became a suspicious feature as well. A brown discoloration, as seen there, was not uncommon in 15th century artwork. The discoloration had come from the degradation of copper pigments. But the foliage in this painting appeared to be intentionally painted where the forger used an umber pigment to create such an effect and give it a false sense of age. That being said, Umberto Giunti was an exceptional and skillful forger. The painting shows sophisticated evidence of forgery, where Junti fused various elements together to create a plausible composition. 
Number 7. Just like the universe, the questions and mysteries surrounding it are just as infinite. Inside this 250 million light year diameter of a bubble, there exists our Earth, Solar System, the whole Milky Way, and various other galaxies. It's within this bubble that the average density of matter is found to be half as high as that of the rest of the universe. Since the beginning of time, the universe has been expanding. At least this is what's demonstrated by Edwin Hubble. It was in 1929 when Hubble, an American astronomer, had found that every galaxy had been pulling further away from us and that the most distant ones are moving at the fastest. This is suggestive that at some point in time, these galaxies had been located in the same spot, a time that may only correspond with the Big Bang event. It was this research that would spark the hubble lemaitre law, which included the Hubble constant, which indicates the rate at which the universe expands. The best estimates are currently around 70 kilometers a second, and this means that the universe expands 70 kilometers a second quicker every 3.26 million years. The problem is that there are two methods of calculation that seem to be rather conflicting. One of them relies on the cosmic microwave background, whereas the other relies on the supernova that are found to appear sporadically in distant galaxies. It's both of these methods that arrive at two values that have a difference of 10%. But a physicist has now come in to solve the mystery that's been splitting the community for a decade. Lucas Lombreiser from the University of Geneva, who's in the theoretical physics department, has come to answer the question as to what speed the universe is expanding. He explained that the two values have become more precise for many years, while still being different from each other. Lombreiser gave consideration to the idea that the universe is not as uniform as claimed. There's no doubt that matter is and has been distributed in a different manner inside a galaxy than outside of it. But to imagine fluctuations within matter's average density, calculated on volumes that are thousands of times more massive is far more difficult. Lombreiser stated that if we were inside of a large bubble where the density of matter is lower than the density of the rest of the universe, it would have consequences on the distance of supernova and on determining HO. All that's required is for this bubble to be incredibly large so that it can include the galaxy serving as a resource for estimating distances. It's further stated that by setting up this diameter of 250 million light years, it would be possible to calculate that the density of matter inside of it is 50% less than the rest of the universe. Therefore, a new value would be found for the Hubble constant, which would be obtained using the cosmic microwave background. It was the aid of this physicist that answered the question as to how fast the universe was expanding. The first method in question had given an estimate of 67.4 HO while the second was 74 HO. It's now known that the estimate is around 70 HO and that the method of cosmic microwave background is found to be the most accurate. Number 6. The Anasazi refers to a Native American tribe who are otherwise known as ancestral Puebloans. They thrived in what's now called the Four Corners area of the United States, meaning that they populated regions such as Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado. The tribe has come to prefer the term Ancestral Puebloans, or the Pueblo tribe. The civilization was known to be hunters as well as gatherers like most Native American tribes. But later, they evolved to become farmers and developed a sophisticated agricultural system, where they made use of dry farming as well as ditch irrigation. The tribe would inhabit the Four Corners for quite some time, until the end of the 13th century. It was speculated that some sort of cataclysmic event had pushed the Puebloans to flee their cliff houses and their homeland. The civilization headed southwards as well as east toward the Rio Grande and the Little Colorado River. Exactly what happened that forced the tribe to leave has been a puzzle that archaeologists have had to face for ages. Today, remnants of the tribe have told the story of the migration, but some of the details here remain secretive. But it appears that in the past decade, archaeologists and researchers involved with the study of such ancient cultures have come to new understandings as to why the tribe had fled. According to Stephen Lexon, a University of Colorado archaeologist, sometime after 1200 AD, the wheels came off. One thing that the Puebloans were known for was their sophisticated cliff houses, and the question as to why they would build on high cliffs began to grow, as well as how they did so. 
During research carried out in these areas, ruins were discovered that the team was uncertain they could reach even with their modernized climbing gear. It was suggested that the civilization had made use of felled tree trunks to reach the cliffs, on which they would build their homes. But some of these dwellings would not be able to be reached in this way. The cliff settlement proved difficult to navigate, and any wrong move would send a team member hurling down the cliffside. It was thought that this particular settlement had been the home to two families who seemed to exude paranoia, as they lived under the constant fear of being attacked. For those who lived on this cliff, the foray for food and water was a dangerous mission. Experts had focused on environmental factors that may have driven the Anasazi from their homeland. By studying tree rings, it was found that there had been a drought that came over the southwest from 1276 to 1299. It's believed that some of these areas had no rain at all for 23 years of the drought. Accompanied by this, the civilization had deforested the region in which they lived in order to use the logs for roof beams and firewood. But environmental factors could not explain everything, as the tribe had lived through more severe droughts without retreating or abandoning the lands. It was then believed that nomadic raiders had been to blame, but there is no evidence to confirm this theory. This is what sparked researchers to look for the answer within the tribe. Lexan explained that there were two critical factors that came about during this time period, which were the unpredictability of the climate and what archaeologists call socialization for fear. Some unorthodox practices that were perpetuated by the Chaco Canyon rulers sparked a society-wide paranoia, or the Anasazi people were socialized to live in fear. While most of ancient history's civilizations were believed to be placid, the Puebloans may have been a rather violent group of people. Throughout various excavations, researchers did not expect to find such violent evidence that suggested something terrible had happened here. It had been due to environmental factors such as drought, as well as internal and external conflicts that would drive the civilization out of their homelands or up on cliff faces. It would later be discovered that poor sanitation, as well as pests, had also been the cause of the sudden dispersal or degradation of the tribe. The cliff dwellers also grew communities far larger than what they could handle, causing internal strife and making life a bit too uncomfortable. Number 5. The Higgsbossen refers to a theory proposed in the 1960s by Peter Higgs from the University of Edinburgh. Higgs had supplied a testable hypothesis for the birth of mass in elementary particles. This particle is one in the standard model of physics. Higgs became the first person to suggest its evidence, and for years it remains just that, a suggestion or a theory. But on the 4th of July in 2012, the particle had finally been discovered. It had been found by researchers at the LHC, or Large Hadron Collider, which is said to be the most powerful particle accelerator in the world at CERN, a laboratory located in Switzerland. It was found through this research that the Higgs boson has a mass of 125 billion electron volts. This means that it's 130 times more massive, according to CERN, than a proton. It also has the quantum mechanical equivalent to angular momentum, which is a charless with zero spin, the only elementary particle that has no spin. A boson refers to a force carrier particle that's present when other particles interact with one another. A photon is a particle as well as a wave that may arise from an excited electromagnetic field. The Higgs boson is a quantized manifestation that comes from the Higgs field. This field generates mass through the interaction with other particles. It was found as well that the Higgs field has a property where the energy is higher when the field is at zero than when it's at non-zero. The particles therefore had acquired their mass by interaction with a non-zero Higgs field when the universe cooled and was less energetic after the Big Bang. It's been theorized that the Higgs boson played a crucial and decisive role in the first minutes after the universe had been born. It was this particle that determined the nature of the vacuum that fills space-time. It's the reason for the existence of matter, as well as the interactions between particles. It was also found that it's responsible for the appearance that mass takes. Without it, there would be no atomic elements such as stars or life in the universe. The particle was discovered and proven at the LHC simultaneously by the two multipurpose experiments named ATLAS and CMS. The boson was observed in two rare decay channels that offered the cleanest signal. 
It was the decay in a pair of photons involving a purely quantum virtual process, as well as the direct decay in two Z bosons. The signal that was detected was believed to be from the Higgs boson, with the mass said to be 125 to 126 giga electron volts. There was additional data that was required in order to confirm these observations, which came in March of 2013. It was also in this year that a Higgs and Belgian physicist had been awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. Number 4. The Clovis people refer to a prehistoric culture of Native Americans that was established around the area of Clovis, New Mexico. It's believed that this culture thrived around 10,000 BC and was most likely the first human inhabitants of this area. But just like a few other ancient civilizations, the Clovis also mysteriously disappeared, leaving the archaeological community absolutely baffled. This culture had once inhabited the area over 13,000 years ago, along with mastodons and mammoths, and thrived for a relatively short amount of time, disappearing around 12,800 years ago. It was also around this time that 35 Ice Age beasts also went extinct. After analyzing some 11 archaeological sites that were linked to the Clovis people, researchers believed that they found the answer as to what may have happened to them. These sites came from California to the Carolinas and Virginia. Researchers associated with the University of South Carolina had discovered that in these areas there had been a presence of platinum, which had been found previously in 2013 in areas of Greenland. According to Albert C. Goodyear, an archaeologist, the team found in a study from California to the Savannah River that the concentrations of platinum were higher than normal. Platinum is often found in asteroids or comets, but no impact site was found, even though the platinum was found to date with the Younger Dryas period, which was a mini ice age that lasted 1400 years after it began about 12,000 years ago, around the same time that the Clovis culture suddenly vanished. The research studies lead author Christopher Moore explained that platinum is not very common in the Earth's crust. He further explained that the presence of the platinum in these sites confirms the data as reported previously for the Younger Dryas in a Greenland ice core. Moore highlighted that this impact would not have been like the one that wiped out the dinosaurs. 65 million years ago, the Earth was subjected to an immense extraterrestrial impact, whereas Younger Dryas was the result of a much smaller one. Two of Moore's university colleagues had contributed to this study. This included Mark Brooks, who's a geoarchaeologist, who's known to conduct excavations at the Savannah River site, as well as aforementioned Albert Goodyear, who spent decades documenting Clovis culture at the Topper site located in Allendale County. It's believed to be the most well-preserved site for the research of this culture. Goodyear and Moore's research had built on research in which they had found trace evidence of extraterrestrial elements, such as iridium at the Younger Dryas layer of the Topper site. This was published in 2012 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The team of three is said to have conducted their research through the Institute of Anthropology. Moore explained that the bottom line of this study is that the presence of platinum within the layers of sediment for the beginning of the Younger Dryas served as evidence for potential cosmic impact having been the cause of the quick decline of a prominent civilization. After decades of not knowing why or how a civilization disappeared into thin air shortly after their establishment, it can finally be assumed that the cause of this was due to a cosmic event, such as space rocks like comets slamming into the glaciers and an evident ice age that additionally took with it 35 animal species. Number 3. A mysterious shipwreck, a 12th century piece of pottery, and a cargo hall have been left a mystery since their discovery in the 1980s. It was a fisherman in the Java Sea off the coast of Indonesia who discovered the wreck and ever since it's been the subject of various studies. It was initially thought that the ship had set sail sometime in the 13th century, but some new findings have experts re-examining their assumption. The practice of branding items with the country of origin has been around longer than you may have thought. On one of these pieces of pottery, a Made in China label was found etched into it. This aided experts to correctly date the cargo and the ship. In addition to the pottery, elephant tusks, art, medicine, and sweet-smelling resin were also discovered here, 
and have given the researchers more of an understanding as to how the vessel fits into the broader picture of the history of China. During the initial investigation in the 1990s, the ship was dated to the mid or late 13th century, but new evidence suggests otherwise. 800 years ago, someone had added a label to the ceramics which basically says made in China, according to Lisa Niziolak from the Field Museum in Chicago. This lucky label states that the ceramics were made in Zhaningfu in the Fujian province. It's a crucial piece of evidence because Zhaningfu was renamed after an invasion by Mongolia around 1278, meaning that the wreck had happened earlier than that, perhaps in 1162 according to other tests. It's unlikely that these pieces would have been stored up and according to researchers bearing its old name, the pottery would have been shipped for sale rather quickly after it had been made. According to Niziolak, there were possibly around 100,000 pieces of pottery on the ship and it would not be likely that the merchant would have paid for them to be stored for such a long period of time. The ceramics are believed to have been made a short period before the ship had sunk. Carbon dating techniques could be applied to some of the other items of cargo, such as the elephant tusks and resin. These had been used to identify that the vessel was somewhere around 700 to 750 years old. But since then, our carbon dating methods have improved. It's partly due to this reason that a re-evaluation was carried out. An accelerator mass spectrometry test, along with the inscriptions on the pottery, have now come to suggest that the wreckage is around 800 years old. This site marks a time when merchants from China had begun to be more active through worldwide trade routes. They switched from moving goods through the Silk Road to becoming more dependent on shipping. It had been thanks to the slight change in the name inscribed on the pottery that this tipped off researchers leading to a solved mystery. Niziolek explained that when they received the results and found that the tusks and resin were older than they thought, they became excited. The team suspected this due to the inscriptions as well as the conversations they'd had with colleagues from China and Japan. It's been said that shipwrecks such as this one provided a crucial look into past events and a fascinating glimpse into history. Number 2. Probably one of the most well-known stories in the Bible is the one where Moses received the Ten Commandments. While the account that most people remember was that Moses ascended Mount Sinai to receive the commandments that he would recite to the Israelites, the story is actually much more complex. Instead, the whole story actually lasted 40 years and the mountain was descended upon eight times during the course of it. The real story involved a golden calf, instructions to build the divine abode, the first and second tablets, and a second covenant. But the question asked by those who don't believe this biblical account is, is Mount Sinai a real place? In the light of recent years, various biblical locations are beginning to be discovered. From Jesus' tomb to the ark and perhaps Mount Sinai. It had been initially thought that the mountain on which Moses had received the Ten Commandments had been situated in Egypt. American Bible researchers have recently claimed that the mountain is actually situated in Saudi Arabia. This was also according to a history enthusiast named Ryan Morrow, who's on a mission to prove that the book of Exodus really happened. It was Exodus where the prophet had led the Israelites to the mountain, which had been engulfed in flames, smoke, and thunderous roars. Mount Sinai is said to be one of the most sacred of places for the Islamic, Christian, and Jewish religions. It's been believed that this sacred place was a mountain in the Sinai Peninsula of Egypt, but according to extensive research conducted by Morrow, not only does the mountain exist, but it also is found in Saudi Arabia. On his mission to prove the book of Exodus, the researcher made a documentary that was named Finding the Mountain of Moses, the Real Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. It's in this documentary that Morrow visits several locations in the country that he believes coincided with the story of Moses. He further states that one of the reasons that scholars state that this book of the Bible is false or a myth is because they have little to no evidence of it taking place at Egypt's Mount Sinai. But perhaps they'd been looking in the wrong spot. He states that if they move over into the Arabian Peninsula, evidence is in abundance of this biblical happening. The real holy mountain, as believed by Maro, is found in the northwestern province in Saudi Arabia. In the Bible, it says that God had descended upon the mountain as a fire. Strangely enough, four blackened peaks have been found in the Jabal Allah's mountains. 
It's also said that Moses had parted the Red Sea to escape the Egyptian troops, which was corroborated by Swedish scientist Dr. Leonard Mahler, who had found some odd coral shaped like chariots under the water. Additionally, there was a discovery of a supposed land passage between Egypt and Saudi Arabia. In this same area, Morrow had also found the towering split rock that was mentioned in the Bible, the same rock that God commanded the prophet to strike, after which water would come gushing forth and it would be provided for the Israelites. It was also near the Saudi Arabian Mount Sinai that a site believed to be the area where people were worshipping cows and bulls has been found. It's here where an ancient altar was discovered that may be a place of the twelve pillars that represent the twelve tribes of Israel. Nine such pillars have been found. Petroglyphs carved into the mountain serve as further evidence of Morrow's claims. Number 1. Since its discovery, the megalithic Angkor Wat has been a mystery to archaeologists. Angkor Wat refers to a 12th century Cambodian temple, and scientists were not quite sure as to how it had been created. The mystery surrounded the blocks that were used in its creation and how they were able to transport these immense sandstone blocks to the site. It was initially believed that the civilization had transported the 5 to 10 million stones through a 54 mile long canal and a river route, but the surfacing of new satellite images shows that this route would have been counteracted and new undiscovered canals that led to the complex have been revealed. It's long been questioned as to how the bricks, some weighing 3,300 pounds, had wound up in the vicinity of the temple. Archaeologists already knew that the rocks had come from nearby quarries at the base of a mountain, but were uncertain as to how they had been moved around. This new canal system led experts to believe that the bricks were ferried across from nearby quarries, along a 22-mile long route instead of a 54-mile one. Estra Uchida of Japan's Waseda University explained that the researchers had found various quarries of sandstone blocks that had been used to build the temples of Angkor. It was this shortcut route that would explain how a 500-acre temple had been built in full in just mere decades. It had been thought that the stones were ferried through a canal, rode to the Siem Reap River, and then rode further upstream against the current through a river to the temple. In order to determine if this was the case, after exhibiting some doubt, Uchida and Ichida Shimoda, along with a team to survey the area, found around 50 quarries along the embankment of Mount Kulin. They would additionally scour satellite imagery where they found a network of canals that linked the quarries to the site. It was this grid of interlinking canals that had suggested that the builders used a shortcut while building Angkor Wat. In order to confirm such a proposition, Mike Hendrickson from the University of Illinois explained that a hunt should be done for any stones that may have fallen overboard during their transportation through the canals. The Khmer Empire where the temple resides, was said to be one of the most powerful empires in Southeast Asia. The building was begun by a king as a tribute to the Hindu god, Vishnu, sometime in the 12th century. The site would later be converted into a Buddhist temple some hundred years later, in the 14th century. The entirety of the temple was constructed within the reign of just one king, which is why such questions and mysteries have come about. The construction had concluded just after the king's passing, circa 1150, after it was repurposed as a Buddhist temple. It continued as such until this day. Angkor Wat had become so deeply ingrained with the Cambodian consciousness that it even appeared on the national flag. It had additionally been rumored that an actress had stated that the temple belonged to Thailand, sparking riots in 2003. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to hit that like button. Also, don't forget to subscribe and click that notification bell to keep up to date with all of our future uploads. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next video.